Thank you and good morning. And can I also acknowledge traditional owners, um, elders past and present in the week when the Closing the Gap was reported and we're only on track to meet two. Um, Jennifer Hewitt suggested that I would get up here and give a searingly political speech. Uh, I note that Warren wandered into the political. I can assure you I'm going nowhere near it. This is categorically the economic part of the business today. And what I want to do is to talk to you a little bit uh, about the Commonwealth budget. The good news is I'm not responsible for revenue. You can discuss that with John Fraser. I'm responsible for spending. And there is, I think, a wide recognition that we actually do need to return the Commonwealth budget to surplus and to have a structurally sound and sustainable position. And that's quite a challenging task, as I think we all know. But it's inevitable that the task that we have to face is about a slowing in growth of government spending. And it's growing faster at the moment than the economy. And without corrective action, uh, it will continue to grow because we have an ageing population and, of course, there's an increasing cost and demand for government-funded services. If we don't... Uh, curb that spending and noting that the real economy and national income will not grow strongly enough to generate the revenue required to fund uh, the currently projected growth, uh, then we don't really have very many choices in relation to the fiscal gap. So the question of the economic uh, and the social desirability of a circumstance we currently face I think is very real. Now, of course, the real uh, outlook for economic and national income growth is constrained by a number of factors, including the things that we all know about, and I think we've just had some uh, overview of things like the global economic headwinds, uh, what's going on in the Eurozone and Japan, and of course, the transition that I think we've just been hearing about from mining, etc. So, of course, if we look at things like the ageing of the population, the reduction in the aggregate workforce participation rate, and hence economic growth, uh, we have some very real structural challenges to deal with. And we all know that productivity is something that we need to think about, and workforce participation. Uh, I did note uh, the reference to the personages in the room, the eminent personages. They're a very good model for all of us about how you can keep engaged in the workforce uh, as the years go on. And we will actually need that, uh, because if everyone shuffles off to retirement at 55, there's going to be a major problem. But I think we should acknowledge that persistent budget deficits would mean uh, growing levels of public debt and, of course, real impacts on government spending on services and the things that people value. So what happened in the 14-15 budget? Well, it was a starting point, and that's what I want to use it for to illustrate some of the structural impacts on Commonwealth expenditure from the kinds of things that we currently spend. And what I'd like to do is look a little bit at projected growth and look at what would be the case in the absence of budget me the budget measures. I don't want to make any comment about the budget measures. I just want to show you what the impacts are without those kinds of adjustments in Commonwealth spending. And I want to talk a little bit about what the structural drivers of growth are. Um, I think this isn't something that's well understood when we have a debate uh, about what is actually going on in terms of government spending. So we had a number of measures announced in the budget which were about achieving a structural adjustment in the growth of that spending and to put the budget on a path to a more sustained and uh, position that we can actually afford as an economy. Okay. So before the measures announced in the budget, and even with taxation receipts allowed to increase as a proportion of GDP through fiscal drag, and we could have a debate about whether that is a good thing economically, the budget would remain in deficit through the next decade. If taxation receipts were capped, uh, the deficit would increase over time. The PBO, the Parliamentary Budget Office, uh, some of you will be familiar with their work, reinforced this view and noted that without action, government spending is unsustainable. Now, with the 14-15 budget measures, in other words, the reduction in expenditure contained in those measures, the budget is projected to be in balance in 18-19 and turn to surplus in 1920, 
with the surplus then increasing to 1.4% of GDP by 2024-25. And that trajectory reflects a significant fall in government expenditure as a proportion of uh, GDP. So it would go from 25.3% in 14-15 to 24.2% in 24 25 as opposed to the rise that was projected in MyEFO, which is the mid-year forecast, in 13-14. So that was released in December of 2013 from 25.9% to 26.5% over the comparable decade. So, again, here, what you can see is the projected budget balance trajectory 2000, uh, to 2024-25, as up updated in the 2014-15 MyEFO, and it's affected by a slightly weaker economic outlook uh, since the budget uh, last May, but the budget is still projected to return to surplus in 2019 and 20. So, What's driving government expenditure in the absence of any corrective action? And it's primarily an ageing population, so we're going to keep you guys in the workforce, due to the baby boomer effect, although I do note that the non-baby boomer up here was whinging about his personal trainer earlier. Um, can I tell you, as a baby boomer, the lesson is never stop, mate. And yes, I got a personal trainer too, and it doesn't clearly hurt as much as that, and it's not that I train any less hard. A lower fertility rate, rate I just say, girls get out and do it for the country, and people living longer. There, of course, are other non-demographic drivers, such as the costs of medical technology, uh, existing policies that govern eligibility conditions, and the indexation of government payments. And, of course, there's new and increasing demand for government supports and services, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, that in a second. Over the last decade, uh, the average annual growth rate uh, for the population cohort aged 65 and over was significantly higher than the average annual growth of the total population. We are getting older. That's a good thing. That's a good news story. Uh, it means we are living longer. Uh, it means we are living uh, lives which can be productive for a longer period. But of course, this in turn does raise the rate of growth in government spending as per capita government spending increases sharply for the cohort of 60 years and older, reflecting largely spending on the age pension, but also health and aged care, and I could tell you a whole bunch about that if you were interested. In addition, as the population ages, the proportion and proportionately more people move into age groups where participation in the labour force is lower, in turn this lowers economic and national income growth. And, of course, tax revenue. While older Australians are likely, we believe, uh, to work longer due to things like educational attainment, greater attachment of women to the workforce and deferment of retirement, it's not actually, we believe, sufficient to offset the downward impact of ageing on the aggregate participation rate. So that is a very crucial factor. And if you look at the numbers of people uh, in retirement and the number of people actually available to uh, fund that, the drop is vertiginous. It is unbelievable. At the 14-15 budget, Around 58% of total expenditure, so we spend for about $415 billion a year, uh, was on social security and welfare, health and education. And the proportion is higher at 70% if you exclude GST uh, payments to the states and PDI, public debt interest. There are several major demand-driven programs, and this is important, these are demand-driven which are predominantly social security and welfare, health and education, and they're amongst the highest growing of expenditures. And that is something which has been occurring over the last decade. These things, unless you manage them, unless you adjust, uh, of course, will have a significant impact on government expenditure. And of course, there are going to be new demand-driven programs meeting growing community needs, the National Disability Insurance Scheme being the classic example. In the 13-14 MyEFO, before the measures in the budget, 
the share of the demand-driven expenditures, the things I was just talking about, uh, was projected to rise from 59% in 13-14 to 62% in 23-24 in the absence of policy change. And if you exclude GST, et cetera, from 74 to 80%. And the 13-14 projections imply that per capita spending on government services in real terms, and this is in 13-14 dollars, would increase from $17,500 in 13-14 to about $19,500 per person by 2023-24. So that's a real increase real increase of 11.5%. And with the measures in the budget, so the reductions in expenditure in the budget, per capita was projected to reduce by about 5%, and that would be, therefore, in 23-24, about $18,500 per capita. So it's still an increase. So the ageing of the population has a direct impact uh, on health expenditure due to ageing, um, and the health needs of older people. As I said, it's a good news story, we live longer, but it actually costs money uh, if people are going to have their health conditions maintained. So we know that for people over the age of 85, we spend about 20 times more in health care than we do on people age 5 to 14. There's also non-demographic factors driving this growth, uh, advances in medical technology. We can now treat and indeed cure things that we had not a hope of even five and 20 years ago. But it also means that the maintenance uh, of care for older people increases in cost. Health expenditure is actually driven by three key things, pharmaceutical benefits, the MBS and money we provide to the states for hospitals. and that is about 13% of government expenditure, so it's not small. Expenditure on the PBS uh, has moderated a little because of a pricing deal we did in respect of old technology drugs and purchasing as commodities. But of course, as cancer rates rise, um, how many of you know how many standard drinks you're allowed every day? How many? Nicely done. What, show me what a standard drink is. That's the bad news. But the reality is our lifestyles are dry, driving an increase in cancer rates. And that means if we can treat them, we actually should be able to give you a longer life, but it's going to cost us money. Social security and welfare, the largest expenditure function, about 35% of total government expenditure, uh, is, of course, growing quite significantly. And the age pension is a very significant component of this at 10%. So expenditure on age pension is expected to grow at an average annual rate of 4% in real terms, well above the projected growth in GDP. This is a major structural challenge for our budget. Aging the population and the indexation, of course, are things which drive this. And there were a range of measures announced in the budget. Uh, I need to say no more about what the current debate is about those. And of course, there are other things which will drive uh, increases in this particular category, most particularly the NDIA. Spending on public administration and public sector efficiencies uh, are also things that people worry about in terms of whether we're getting best, best value for money. I think it's important for me to actually make a point about this because, in fact, evidence suggests that this is actually not the major source and the major driver of growth in government outlays. Gross expenditures in the general government sector in nominal terms uh, with departmental expenses excluding defence, so put that to one side, have actually declined over the past five years from around 9% in 2009 10 to around 8% in 2014. So whilst the proportion of total departmental spending is expected to increase in the next little while, and that's predominantly a classification issue which I'm about to fix, I hope, to do with the inclusion of the NDIS and all of it in that particular category. Um, I've been in the minister's ear and he agrees with me, so I, I literally I think I'm about to fix this. The reality is uh, that we expect departmental expenses to significantly fall to around 6% of total gross uh, uh, 
government spending in 17-18. So that's well be below the proportion in 2019. And there have been 5.8 billion, that's B, billion, of savings achieved through a series of departmental efficiency measures. So I think it is important to debunk what is a bit of a myth that runs that actually if we just got you know, government and efficiency of government working well, we could actually manage all of this. We're actually a relatively small proportion of the spend. So restraining spending growth is really uh, the thing that we actually need to manage in the medium term. Because if we don't address the structural drivers, and that of course is the policy and program settings, uh, the challenge of actually getting government expenditure to a sustainable level is, is very real. And the structural budget deficit cannot rely simply on a strategy of stronger economic growth. And things like the terms of trade and the ageing of the work for, uh, population, labour force participation, uh, it actually means we have some structural challenges that we actually have to address. And similarly, uh, if you look at taxation receipts, there are many issues here that I think we're going to have to have a much more sophisticated conversation with the community about because uh, we cannot expect what historically would have dragged us out of these positions to do so today. Reducing spending growth, therefore, is going to require choices to be made. And those choices will have to involve an engagement and a discussion with the community. A number of the budget measures move in that direction. Uh, their fate remains uncertain. But we in the public sector have quite a lot to do, I think, in assisting government in providing uh, an explanation to the community about why the circumstances are as they are and why if we don't address uh, current issues around the structure of the budget, we will all pay in the longer term. Thank you.